Okay, we're going to be talking about sulcine gyri, the surface of the brain, which is one of the most important lectures we can have because you know that the sulci are the landmarks we can have in, when we expose the brain. They lead us to the sulci that we can use either as landmarks to do our surgery or also as microneurosurgical corridors. And we'll be talking about uh, this tomorrow, how to use the sulci and how to recognize them in surgery. I, I usually start this lecture with uh, some historical slides that are very interesting, but I'm going to skip this for the sake of time because we are a little bit behind. But I just want to mention that uh, man has been interested in the in brain for many, many, many centuries. Uh, you take the borehole, for example, the trephination. This is the first uh, si most systematized approach that has been done by mankind, you know. So it's the interest in seeing the brain is very, very old. But it's interesting that the ventricles, the deep, uh, the deep structures were were uh, were uh, were how would say described many, many centuries ago. But until very recently, everybody thought that the surface of the brain was very chaotic. That there was no organization in the uh, in the uh, in the sulci and gyri, okay, and it was only in 1860, 160 years ago more or less, that as I told you already, Louis Gratiolet understood that there was an organization of the sulci and gyri. Okay? Let me just show, come back here. I'm sorry. Let me just show two, 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 three D slides. Two, two D slides. Just remove your glasses, and. What we're going to be emphasizing is that we're going to have three longitudinal gyri, both in the frontal region and in the temporal region. The sylvan fissure and the suprasylvan area is divided by two oblique gyri, of course, the pre and the post central. Parietal lesion has two quadrangular lobules, superior parietal lobule and inferior parietal lobule. Inferior parietal lobule has two semicircular gyri, the supramarginal and the angular. We're going to be showing this many times. Occipital region in men is very, is, is very variable. It's, it's not constant anatomically. But you're always going to have one superior longitudinal gyro that's going to be called the superior occipital gyrus, and another longitudinal one here at the base, which is the inferior occipital gyrus. The middle occipital gyrus is it's very, very, very much variable. So, but this organization you're going to be finding in every brain, every brain. So you have to know the details about this organization to recognize, as you're going to see here. In in the medial surface, as I said, is much more constant anatomically because it's very old. So we have a very well defined inner circle, which is the, of course, the cingulate and the parahypocampal gyri, and then. Very constant anatomical gyri that con constitute a, a, a more external circle, and of course they are continuations of the uh, of the superolateral surface of the brain. So we have just to insist and to have in mind this organization to understand everything. Okay, so let's put our glasses and start here. Okay, first thing we have to understand is that the pia mater is very, very much attached to the brain surface. You cannot remove the pia mater without damaging the, 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 the brain surface. You see light is reflecting here because the pia mater is there, just like the appendium and the ventricle that reflects light. The, the, these, the, these two membranes are very, very much attached to the, to the, to the, uh, to the surface. And of course, they go along every indentation every 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 part of the, the deep part of the suicide. Now the arachnoid is like a big envelope that envelopes the whole CNS. So having said this we have to understand the suicide and the fissures we are the more most constant uh, suicide more deep and more constant we have to understand them as as as, as an extension of the subarachnoid space. So suci and fissures are extensions of the subarachnoid space. Now, when we have an interruption of a suci, it's because we have a connection. It's because we have a connection. So the, the, the cortical surface 
is continuous not only along these connections, but of course along the depth of the soci. Inside the soci, you're always going to have small gyri. These small gyri, generically, they are called transverse gyri. Transverse gyri. Now, having said this, this why, why, why this is this, this way? Because, as I said, throughout evolution, soci, they, were, they, 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 they came because of an enfolding process of the whole surface that increased threefold the, the surface of the brain. So it's very hard to say when, when, when you have a connection, if a gyro, when, 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 where the gyro ends. So number one, we have to understand, just as, as we understand that the soci are extensions of the subarachnoid space, and they, they are, most of the soci are interrupted. They are not always linear. This is the central sulcus. I know because this is a beautiful view that is paracentral lobule in the intermespheric fissure, okay? But most of the soci are interrupted, and most of the soci are not linear. So the soci, when I say superior frontal sulcus, I'm, I'm meaning a concept, a concept, because it's very variable. The same thing when I say superior frontal, so precentral -pre gyrus, I'm talking about a region. A gyrus is a region. It's not a very well-defined structure. That's we have to understand to, 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 to understand because it's very variable. Now, given the infolding process that took place in the brain evolution, at the same time that the brain was bending around the center, which is the thalamus, all suicide from the superolateral surface of the brain, which we also call convexity, superolateral surface of the brain and of the base of the brain, every suicide is pointing to the nearest ventricular cavity, always. This is very helpful when you go to surgery because if you're going along a sulcus, you have to know that you are going towards the nearest ventricular cavity. Very important, we're gonna be seeing this many times. Now, when you go to the mesial surface, it's different. In the mesial surface, the development of the soci are dependent on the development of the corpus callosum. So that's why they are parallel to the corpus callosum. You see here, we did remove the posterior part of the middle frontal gyrus. You have here the superior frontal sulcus and the inferior frontal sulcus. You see that naturally it takes us to the nearest ventricular cavity. Very important to for when practicing neurosurgery, microneurosurgery. If you have an agenis, this is the corpus callosum. Development of the corpus callosum takes place from anterior to posterior. If you have an agenesis of corpus callosum, you see that the soci of the medial surface is completely disorganized because these soci are dependent on the development, the normal development of the corpus callosum. Okay, when you look to the superlateral surface of the brain in the specimen, and particularly in surgery, the only sulcus that you can very securely identify, of course, is the lateral sulcus of the brain, which we call the sylvan fissure, the lateral fissure of the brain. It's always identifiable, and it's always continuous. It's always deep. Why? Because it came because of the bending of the whole brain throughout phylogeny. Of course, it separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. Frontal lobe, we're going to be seeing three longitudinal gyri. The middle one is the biggest one. The temporal region, the same thing, superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyri. When you look at the sylvan fissure, you're always going to find a place that you have an enlargement of the fissure. We call this anterior sylvan point. Tomorrow, we're going to be seeing the sulco key points, and this is the prototype of a sulco key point, anterior sylvan point. It was described as sylvan point, but nowadays we also mention that the, 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 the end of the fissure is the posterior sylvan point. Yes, Agil. This is anterior sylvan point. And from the anterior sylvan point, you divide, you divide the lateral surface, the, the, the sylvan fissure, in 
a, a, a part that is anterior, also called sphenoidal, and also called stem of the sylvan fissure. Posterior to this, you have the lateral part of the sylvan fissure or posterior part of the sylvan fissure. From the anterior sylvan point, you always have an anterior ascending branch. Anterior because you have a posterior ascending branch, posterior there, anterior ascending branch. And you have an horizontal branch. You always have this. So, of course, here you would have the pars triangularis, the triangular part of the inferior frontal gyrus. The inferior frontal sulcus is always interrupted, always interrupted, because you have many connections between the middle frontal and the inferior frontal gyri. So inferior frontal sulcus is always interrupted. And inferior frontal gyrus has three parts. The part triangular part that is in between the anterior ascending and the horizontal branches, the orbital part that it's more anterior, and the opercular part that it's posterior to the pars triangularis. Pars triang the, the anterior sylvan point, you can always identify in a specimen and in a surgery because the pars triangularis is always, always, always more retracted. It's always smaller. Then the pars orbitalis is always bulging. When you're going to open your sylvan fissure, the, 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 place, the, the, the convolution that you want to put your, your, your suction because it's bothering you, it's always the orbital part. Pars triangularis, very flat and very more retracted. So this, this enlargement. So this enlargement, anterior sylvan point, is at the base of pars triangularis and just anterior to the pars opercularis. Sometimes, many times, pars triangularis look like a new and not as a beautiful triangle as here. But always, always harbor a branch from the inferior frontal sulcus that comes inside the pars triangularis, the triangular part. You're going to be seeing this in many specimens and in surgery tomorrow. Now, the pars opercularis, as I already said, is the most beautiful U of the brain because it always, always has this, 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 this format of a U-shape and always, 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 always harbor inside it the precentral sulcus. So it's much easier to identify the precentral sulcus than the central sulcus because the precentral sulcus always will went inside this beautiful U, as you're going to be seeing. Posterior to the pars opercularis, of course, you're going to have the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Precentral gyrus, oblique gyri. They are connected here inferiorly and superiorly. This inferior connection that used to be called front, inferior frontal parietal connection of Broca, nowadays is called subcentral gyrus. The superior frontal parietal connection of Broca, nowadays is called paracentral lobule. Again, you're going to see very different nomenclatures, but the nomenclature I'm telling you here, it, it is the nomenclature given by Uno and Yasagyo, famous good book, famous book, Susai and Jaira of the Brain, and in, in volume 4, 8 of Professor Yasagyo, you have all this detailed anatomy. So this is precentral, this is postcentral, this is subcentral gyrus. And in the, in the midline, you're going to have the paracentral lobule. So what we call the central lobe is just like an ellipse that is excavated by the central sulcus. By the way, the nomina anatomica describe different lobes in different editions of the nomina. The last edition, I think it was 98, something like that, was the international nomenclature for, for, for anatomy. They described the parahypocampal the, the gyrus and the singular gyrus as the limbic lobe. So, according to the nomina, we have a frontal lobe, we have a parietal lobe, we have an occipital lobe, we have a temporal lobe, we have an insular lobe, and we have now a limbic lobe. The parahypocampal gyrus does not belong more to the temporal, to the temporal lobe. It belongs to the limbic lobe. This is official anatomy, official anatomy nomenclature. Now, since Painfield, since Painfield and then Hasmussen in Montreal Neurological Institute doing epilepsy, they refer to this area here as the Rolandic area. <laughs> 
or central area, because this is very different from the frontal and parietal. And if you take Professor Yasajiu's book again, which I think it's a sort of a Bible for us microneurosurgeons, he named this central lobe, but it's not in the nomina yet. We're just writing a paper about this, but this is central lobe. So central lobe is precentral and postcentral gyrus. This is frontal lobe, just anterior to the precentral sulcus. Of course, posterior to this, you have the postcentral sulcus. Now, just as you have this base of the, the opercular part, base of the central lobe, okay, it makes the precentral sulcus and the central sulcus do not reach the, the cervical fissure. But it's very frequent for this bottom of this convolutions here to be inside the fissure. So it seems that the, the central sulcus reaches the precentral and the, the central and the, also the postcentral. Here, for example, it seems that it reaches the cervical fissure, but it doesn't. You have inside here, getting inside the opercular surface, you have another, another connection like this here. So the branches of the sylvan fissure are all only the anterior ascending, the horizontal, and then posterior here, the posterior ascending, and sometimes a descending. And two very small ones, anterior subcentral and posterior subcentral, that delineate the subcentral gyrus. The pars opercularis always is continuous with the precentral. You always have this. Always have this. And so you're going to always to have the anterior subcentral. And the same happening here. You're always going to have the posterior subcentral. So branches of the sylvan fissure, anterior ascending, horizontal, anterior subcentral, posterior subcentral, posterior ascending, and sometimes a descending terminal branch down there. As I said, operculum in curtains. So, pars triangularis will be covering the first gyros, gyra, short gyros of the insula. Only the first. So, the, the, the frontal operculum starts here at the horizontal part and ends after the postcentral gyros. Frontal parietal operculum. Orbital part does not belong to the frontal parietal operculum because it's not covering the insula. Temporal operculum is only the superior temporal gyrus. I'm going to be showing this. Well, superior temporal sulcus is usually continuous. Here you have a little interruption. It's very deep sulcus. Inferior temporal is always, 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 always interrupted just like the inferior frontal. So there's, there are many things that are very, very similar in the brain. Superior frontal sulcus, very deep, good corridor. Superior temporal sulcus also, usually continuous, usually continuous. Inferior frontal sulcus, always interrupted. Inferior temporal sulcus, always interrupted. I'm going to be showing many times that the inferior temporal gyrus is very it's high, it's very small. It's very deep in here. It's very long at the base. So it's very hard to expose in a craniotomy the inferior temporal gyrus. You have to drill the base. Otherwise, you're never going to expose. The sucus you're going to be seeing, it will be the superior temporal sucus. It's hard to expose the inferior temporal sucus. You have to drill a lot of bone. Of course, you have a frontal pole, a temporal pole, an occipital pole. So, when you look in surgery, you see enlargement of the fissure, anterior sylvan point. So, you have to believe in what you know. The more you know, the more you see, okay? So, if this is anterior sylvan point, this is pars triangularis, retracted. This is horizontal branch. This is anterior ascending branch. This is pars triangularis, retracted. Pars orbitalis, always bulging. This is pars opercularis. So this is precentral sulcus. Anatomy is this. This is anatomy. These veins are always here. Professor Yasser Gil, when he describes the sylvan fissure, he always emphasized that you see those small veins, and that, that's where the anterior sylvan point is, and that's where you should start opening your, your sylvan fissure. <laughs>
another specimen, anterior seven point, enlargement. Pars triangularis, the branch that comes from the inferior frontal sulcus. Beautiful you, pars opercularis. So this is precentral sulcus. Precentral sulcus always interrupted, always, because all the all 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 the frontal gyri are inserted, connected to the precentral gyrus. All all of them. The biggest connection, of course, is between the middle frontal and the precentral. Always very visible, always superficial. We'll come back to this. Sometimes, as in this specimen, you have a shallow sulcus dividing this middle frontal gyrus in two parts. So this is then will be called middle frontal sulcus. Not important. Important are the superior frontal sulcus, very important, very important corridor. And inferior frontal sulcus always interrupted. It's a, a very important landmark, a very important concept. Because in, uh, inferior to it, you have the three parts of the inferior frontal gyrus. Orbital, Triangular and opercular, precentral, postcentral, anterior subcentral, small anterior subcentral ramus, bigger posterior subcentral ramus. Well, the sylvan fissure or lateral sulcus of the brain, according to the nomina, ends with an, a, a posterior ascending. You have the posterior sylvan point, anterior sylvan point, posterior sylvan point, and from here, you have this branch that is posterior ascending. And sometimes you have this descending. If we come to the parietal region, you're always going to see a very deep sulcus dividing the parietal region in two lobules, superior parietal lobule and inferior parietal lobule. Of course, the sulcus is called intraparietal sulcus. Intraparietal, so very deep just as the superior frontal, very deep, important corridor to, towards the atrium. This is precentral again, so this is central. Anterior subcentral, posterior subcentral. The subcentral gyrus is getting inside the operculum here, opercular surface, and come back. So this is postcentral sulcus. Inferior part of postcentral sulcus always, pretty much always, continues with the intraparietal. Some authors called, as, as Duvernoy, for example, that has a beautiful book about the hippocampus, the most important book about the hypo anatomy of hippocampus is Duvernoy. Duvernoy, and he has another very nice atlas of the whole brain, he calls intraparietal not only this sulcus here, but only the inferior part of the postcentral. I'm just bringing this here to mention that this is always continuous. But Yasagil called post-central all this. And most authors just call post-central all this. Interparietal sulcus divides the parietal lobe into a superior parietal lobule, quadrangular, and inferior parietal lobule. Inferior parietal lobule always has anterior the supramarginal gyrus, that is called supramarginal because it's around the margin of the, the sylvan fissure. Supramarginal, it's over, the supra, over this margin. Supramarginal and the angular gyrus. In this specimen, you're seeing a beautiful angular gyrus, look like a horseshoe format, but usually it's not this way. Usually it's not very well defined. So again, some gyri are very well defined. Pars opercular is always very well defined. Supramarginal gyrus, always very well defined. Angular, no. Now, superior temporal sulcus, usually continuous, very, very, very deep, ends at posterior temporal point here. Posterior temporal point is always posterior and inferior to the posterior sylvan point. And from here, superior temporal sulcus usually trifurcates. Sometimes it just bifurcates. This most superior branch always will be dividing the supramarginal from the angular. 
and it's called intermediary sucrose because it's intermediary of the inferior parietal lobule, intermediary sucrose of Jensen. Now, it turns out that intermediary sucrose of Jensen, just in this specimen, as in this specimen, very frequently is con it's, it's, it, it comes from the intraparietal as well. So intermediary sucrose usually is the same sucrose that emerges from here and comes from here. But sometimes you have two. When you have two, it's because you have a connection between the supramarginal and the angular. Now, inferior temporal sucrose is always, always interrupted. Now, if we take superior temporal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus will be always continuous with the supramarginal, always. You're always going to have this, always. Now, superior temporal sucus, superior branch, I already talked about, intermediary sucus, and the distal branch always gets inside the angular gyrus, always. Just as superior ascending part gets inside the supramarginal, the distal superior temporal gets inside the angular gyrus, the angular gyrus region. Since this always happened, the, the, middle, frontal, the middle temporal gyrus is always continuous with the angular. Always, always, always. When you come to the occipital region, we're going to be seeing other specimens, the vertical superior occipital gyrus. And you always have an inferior occipital gyrus that is longitudinal down here. Inferior temporal gyrus always continues with inferior occipital gyrus. And usually you have this preoccipital notch here. This preoccipital notch separates what is temporal from what is occipital. So this is inferior occipital gyrus. This is inferior temporal gyrus. So again, superior temporal gyrus is always continuous with the supramarginal. Middle temporal gyrus is always continuous with the angular. Inferior temporal gyrus always continues with inferior occipital. And we're going to be seeing that inferior occipital turns the corner here, gets into the interhemispheric fissure as the lingual gyrus. And lingual gyrus will be continuous with parahypocampal gyrus. So we have a basal ring here that is given by the inferior temporal, inferior occipital, lingual, and then parahypocampal. It's a basal ring. Superior temporal, supramarginal, middle temporal, angular. So you always have to see, you see better the suicide in the T1 without contrast, without enhancement. You're always going to see anterior sylvan point. You, you ask for a lateral view, and you're going to recognize all this. Anterior sylvan point, parts triangularis, beautiful U, pars opercularis. This is precentral sucus. This is post-central, this is central. The so-called central lobe is always quadrangular when seen sagittal. Lateral fissures, sylvan fissure, gets inside the supramarginal. So this is supramarginal gyrus, continues with the superior temporal. This is post-central sucus, continues with the intraparietal. This is supramarginal. This is intermediary sucus. This is angular gyrus. So when you recognize one landmark, you recognize everything. Let me just emphasize, this piece of brain here, it belongs to the supramarginal. Why? Because it's continuous with the superior temporal here. Where is this lesion exactly? This is the nidus of a small AVM, left side. What do you see here? The first beautiful you. Pars opercularis. So what sucus is this? Precentral. Anterior sylvan point. Here it is, enlargement. This is triangular part. When Broca described the area of Broca, he was talking about the pars triangularis and the anterior part of pars opercularis, exactly where the nidus is. The nidus is exactly here. Nowadays, we know that Broca area 
it doesn't exist like a single area. All Perisylvan area is related with language, as you know. But here's a primary area. If you have a trauma and you have a contusion here, don't aspirate because the patient will tell, will be able to tell you thank you. But the vernic area, that it's in the distal part, in the third part, the third posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus, and a little bit in the supramarginal, is more spread. If you have a contusion here and you aspirate, most patients will have no aphasia or dysphasia. But here, this is a primary cortical area. But if you have, I think we have something being projected over. Now, when, you, when what, what Hooks Dufault had shown and many others, when you have a low-grade tumor going, growing here, the Broca area goes somewhere else, and you can remove this area when you have the patient awake. But originally, the Broca area is right here, and the Wernicke area is right here. And this inferior parietal lobule is what is called by many authors the Gashwin territory. So this is anterior part of Paso percolaris, the core of the so-called Broca's area. I always say that if I have to give a lecture with a single slide, I would use this slide because it shows so many things. Let's start here. We're talking about the central lobe. You see, this is the first present oblique gyrus. This is longitudinal, so this is the precentral gyrus. So this is the postcentral, and I have a beautiful U here, always beautiful U. So this is opercular part. This is opercular part. This is central sucus. And you see how posterior the opercular part is? It's always lying over the atrium, very posterior. Everything anterior is superior temporal gyrus. This is all superior temporal gyrus. Okay, but at this point, what I want to show is this new surface here. The superior surface of the temporal lobe. What people also call opercular surface of the temporal lobe. We did remove here the superior curtain of the insula. You see, we did not remove the orbital part, which is bulging, because the orbital part is not covering the insula. Pars triangularis would be here, covering the most anterior short insular gyrus. Now, superior temporal gyrus has this opercular surface that is covering the insula. So this is temporal opercular. But when you see the whole superior temporal surface, you have a very well-defined gyrus here that is always pointing, almost reaching the atrium. It's a transverse gyrus because it's inside the sulcus, inside the fissure. It turns out that this is our biggest transverse gyrus we have. So this is what gyrus is this? Heschel gyrus. So Heschel gyrus, sometimes it's double, but usually it's single gyrus, long transverse gyrus, always almost reaching the atrium. And the Heschel gyrus divides the superior surface of the temporal lobe in an anterior oblique one, what is called the polar plane, and a flat plane posterior to it that is called temporal plane. The oblique plane, which is the polar plane, this is all polar plane next to the pole, is the real curtain of the insula, the real temporal operculum. This is not temporal operculum anymore. It's not covering the insula. It's posterior to the Heschel gyrus. It's always flat, always triangular, with the apex just next to the atrium. So, when you look at MRI and you see a fissure like this, it's because you are anterior to the Heschel gyrus. If you see it flat, it's because you are at the, level, at the temporal, at the Heschel gyrus or posterior to it. So, just by seeing the fissure, you have to know where you are, coronally. Come back to this. Beautiful you, opercular part. It's the easiest, easiest convolution to recognize, opercular part. So this is what, what sucus is this? Precentral, always. Triangular part, 
more always more retracted, always with this branch, small branch coming from the anterior frontal, always. So this is all orbital part. It's not a, not a divine convolution. It's an area. It's a region, orbital part. It turns out that pars triangularis and pars opercularis are regions that are much more constant, very well defined. Anterior subcentral, posterior subcentral, subcentral gyrus, central sulcus. What gyrus is this here we're talking about? Heschel. It goes posterior to the insula. Heschel goes posterior to the insula. Okay? Always. Always. So, when you open the fissure here, it's harder because here the fissure is very flat. It slips. Here it's easy because it's oblique. But this point is to show that the Heschel gyrus in the surface always have this bulging here. Always, always have this bulging. And that's how new radiologists recognize the Heschel gyrus. For us neurosurgeons, another, another relationship, very important. The post-central gyrus is always, 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 always sitting over the Heschel gyrus, always. So when you see this, this is Heschel gyrus going towards the atrium. That's how radiologists recognize because of this bulging here. They put this marker at the bulging here, and then they see here. This is Heschel gyrus. This is Heschel gyrus. Always this bulging. Just by this scene being Heschel gyrus, I can guarantee to you that this is post-central gyrus. And this is subcentral gyrus. Post-central. This is pre-central gyrus, and this is pre-central sulcus. So if you know two or three landmarks, you recognize everything. Okay? You recognize everything. Opercular part. I put this slide here to remind me that I have to start talking about the insula. But first, one thing that I didn't mention, the temporal pole is a connection between the superior temporal gyrus and the inferior temporal gyrus. The middle temporal gyrus is always shorter. So the, the neocortical part of the temporal pole is always the superior temporal gyrus connecting to the inferior temporal gyrus. Okay, a point in anatomy is not a point in geometry. So all this region here is anterior sylvan point. Everything here. Because this is wide opening. Pars opercularis, and this part's very small, pars triangularis, here with the small branch coming here. Very retracted. Everything is retracted, so you have a big lake here. But this is to emphasize that just underneath the anterior sylvan point, you always have the apex of the insula. Apex of the insula is the highest part of the insula, the lateral surface of the insula. And it's always a, just underneath the anterior sylvan point. Pars triangularis will be covering the most anterior short insula gyrus. The pars orbitalis is not covering at all the insula. So when you open the anterior sylvan point, you know that you are at the, at, at, the, at the apex of the insula here, apex of the insula. In this patient, is a little bit flat, but that's the important. Why this is important? Because if you scratch here, you're going to have the uncinate fascicle coming here and the IFOF coming here. Both the IFOF and the uncinate are exactly, they, 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 they funeral, you know, they open this way and they open this way, but here they are more narrow, they funeral here, and when they are together, they are exactly underneath the apex of the insula. Very important relationship. So when you look at this, you know the uncinate will be here, and the i will be coming down here, posterior to the uncinate. Now, we always think about the insula regarding its lateral surface. But the insula has a big anterior surface, very big, as you see. And again, relationships. To expose the anterior insular surface, I just had to remove the posterior orbital gyrus. We're going to be seeing that the posterior orbital gyrus always resembles a Napoleon hat. It's a pretty much well-defined anatomically gyrus, orbital, posterior orbital gyrus. If you remove the posterior orbital gyrus, anatomically, you expose the anterior 
surface of the insula. This is all temporal pole, temporal plane, because it's covering the insula. The Heschel gyrus will be here, going posteriorly, posterior to the insula. Now, again, I did remove the frontoparietal operculum, which does not include the orbital part, and I did remove the temporal operculum, which is only the superior temporal gyrus. This is the middle, this is the inferior. And I expose completely the lateral surface of the insula. This is the apex here. But again, apex in anatomy is a region. So this is all apex, and I'll tell you why. You see two types of gyri here. You see some gyri that are coming from a common area. And you see two other gyros, gyri that are not related with the apical region. Anatomy definitions. Short gyra of the insula are all gyri that are arising from the apical region, the apex. Anterior short, middle short, posterior short gyros, which is divided as a Y here in two. The long gyri of the insula are not related with the apex. So the long gyre of the insula, you can have two, and which is very common to have a single one that bifurcates here, just like a Y. Between the posterior and long gyres of the insula and the anterior and short gyres of the insula, you have the central sucos of the insula. The central sucos of the insula is continuous with the central sucos of the brain. Let's see if I'm right. This is longitude, this is oblique, this is oblique, no more oblique here. So this is pre-central, this is post-central, so this is central. Inferior frontal, pre-central. Pre-central would be ending in the pars opercularis that would be here. And pars triangularis would be anterior covering just the anterior short insular gyros here. And pars orbitalis is not covering the insula. You always have these relationships, always. Now, around the insula, you have a big sucus that used to be called circular sucus of the insula. But it's too big. It's just like saying going to Europe, okay? So it is divided now in anterior limiting sucus, superior limiting sucus, and inferior limiting sucus of the insula. Both the superior and the inferior are just deflections. Now, the anterior limiting sucus is very deep. It's all the space that is anterior to the anterior surface of the insula. In between the anterior surface of the insula and the posterior orbital gyrus. Very deep anterior limiting sucus of the insula. Superior and inferior are very shallow. They are just deflections. Next slide. This is apex of insula here. The real apex is here. Next slide, we're going to be focusing here. There will be a specula bringing the superior temporal gyrus inferiorly. Oh, I'm sorry. Initially, the subcortical white matter of the insula shows that all these short gyri come from the same region. And you have two long gyri, uh, one long gyrus here of the insula bifurcating. This is a single long gyrus of the insula. This would be the central sucus of the insula. That's something also Yajagiu says in his book. If you want to know the real gyrus, where it ends, you have to see the, the depth of the gyri. The, 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 in between the U, U fibers that put this gyrus together with the other gyrus. So the Subcortically, you see that these gyrus are coming from the same region for sure. But next slide will be pushing the superior temporal gyrus inferiorly. And I'm just exposing the anterior short gyrus of the insula here. So what is this here? What is this? Pars opercularis, beautiful you with the precentral sucos here. A little piece of pars triangularis that was not removed that would be here. But this slide is to show that you have an interruption here of the circular sucus of the insula, namely of the anterior limiting sucus and the inferior and inferior limiting sucus. When you have an interruption of the sucus, it's because you have a gyrus going through. 
you have a small gyrus coming there, coming from the apex and going towards the posterior orbital gyrus. Is the anterior transverse gyrus of the insula. Why is that important? Because this delineates what is, is called the limbing insula. Limbing insula is the most inferior limit of the insula. And you see, you always have this U-shaped here. And this is what people used to say, used to say that this is limbing insula. But limbing insula is just superior. Is where the transverse gyrus is, 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 is passing through. But in surgery, when you open widely the cervical fissure, you're going to be seeing this use here. And you say, here's the limbing insula. If I cut, if I cut here, I'm at the depth of the anterior limiting sulcus, just as here. And I get to a recess of the anterior, anterior horn just anterior to the head of the caudate. And I have in between just fibers, the anterior limb of the internal capsule, which functionally are not important. This is very important because if you are above the apex of the insula, you're related with the ventricle. If you are below, you are in that region that we call ventrostriatum. We're going to be coming to this right away. So if you open widely the sylvan fissure, in the right side you can remove the pars triangularis and even the pars opercularis to expose the anterior limiting sucus of the insula. Or you open the anterior ascending, the horizontal, and you retract everything, you're going to be exposing the superior part of the anterior limiting sucus, just as here. And you see how close you are to the ventricle? Now, you see the apex of the insula here. If you get in here, you're not going to get into the ventricle. You're going to get into behind the anterior perforate substance. You're going to get inside the ventral striatum. When we talk about insular tumors, maybe tomorrow, we're going to be seeing that the insular tumors get inside here. <coughs> now, if that's, if that's the, uh, the, the, the anterior horn, what is the anterior wall of the horn? You see the anterior horn there, and you see there is an anterior wall. What is the anterior wall of the horn? You have to believe in what you know. Pardon? The genu. So the genu, that's the genu of the callosum there. You have to believe, because this is, in, this is the anterior part of the anterior horn. This is the apex. So it's very common to be operating a GPM here, and suddenly you had a lot of CSF coming out. Say, oops, what happened? It's because you are very close to the ventricle. You see how close you are to the ventricle when you reach the depth of the anterior limiting sucus of the insula. You see the beautiful U here? Precentral sucus. Uh, it, different specimens. Now, if you go along the Heschel gyrus, you're going to the ventricle. So if you stick your finger here, you're just half centimeter from the atrium. So the Heschel gyrus is always pointing to the atrium. Everything anterior will constitute the central core of the brain. That Eduardo is going to give you a lecture about this. And anterior half of the insula related with the head of the caudate, posterior half related with the thalamus and with the body of the caudate, hence with the posterior limb of the capsule. And for Amiel Monroe, almost in the middle here, Genu of the capsule will be here. Here would be anterior limb. Posterior limb, and genu would be right here. Central core. Superior temporal sucus. Very continuous, usually. And deep. So this is all superior frontal gyrus. Sometimes you have a shallow gyrus inside it, and it's called medial frontal sucus. Not important. Medial frontal sucus, very shallow. Superior frontal sucus, very deep. And as I'm going to show you tomorrow, the suci are variable, but the points where they meet are more constant. And usually you have an enlargement of the fissure, of, of, the, of the subarachnoid space. This is what we'll call tomorrow sucal key points. And superior temporal sucus is always pointing the omega region. 
which is the hand representation. And then, immediately, you have a beautiful U, which is the paracentral lobule. Of course, this is central sucus. Precentral, post central sucus. This is precentral. I already said that the front, superior middle frontal gyrus is the biggest frontal gyrus and always have a superficial connection with the precentral gyrus. The connection of the superior frontal with, with, with the precentral is more medial, almost inside the fissure as is in here. And what's the name of this area that it's the medial and posterior part of the superior frontal gyrus? What area is this? What is it? S SMA. Very important because the French cooperative study of low-grade gliomas, they have very interesting papers, and there's one about anatomy of the tumors. If you take the SMA area low grades and the insular low grades, they constitute 50-51% of the low-grade tumors in there in all the cases, thousands of cases. So it's very, very common to have tumors here. You all know this. Low grade and also high grade, as you have in the insular region, unfortunately. So if you see a tumor like this in the precentral gyrus, and you, you can understand it, it's going to the middle frontal sucus because of that connection there. That's the connection that we just saw anatomically, and that's how the tumor go through. And then it goes underneath the superior frontal sucus to reach the superior frontal gyrus. Beautiful you. Beautiful you. Paracentral lobby. So this is central sucus, always beautiful you. But if you go more posterior, you're always going to recognize the interparietal sucus. Interparietal sucus. Very, very deep, as you see here. So, this is superior parietal lobule, and this is inferior parietal lobule. You see, this is inferior parietal lobule, this is interparietal. So, the post central is continuous ahead, anterior. This is post central sucus here. So, what gyrus is this? Of course, supramarginal. And what gyrus is this? Angular, of course. Now, when you go more posterior, you always have this deep sucus here. Always. Let's see what is this deep. And you always have another beautiful U here. What is the deep sucus? If we come here, what sucus is this? Yeah, don't be afraid. That's it. What sucus is this? Calcary fissure. This is lingual gyrus. What gyrus is this? Cuneus, yes. This is calcarine. From the middle of the calcarine, you have this very deep sucus. Which is sucus is this? Parietoccipital. Separates the cuneus from the precuneus. Now, it turns out that the parietoccipital sucus is so deep that you always have this depth of the parietoccipital sucus. Always, 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 always. Nowadays, by a group of radiologists of Canada, it's being called parieto-occipital incisure. I think it's a good name. Parieto-occipital incisure is the depth of the parieto-occipital fissure or sucus. And this connection here, Broca called parieto-occipital connection of Graciolet. Parieto-occipital, because this is parieto, this is occipital. Parieto-occipital connection of Garciolet. And these authors in Canada, they call parieto-occipital arc. I think it's a good name. Parieto-occipital arc and parieto-occipital incisure. Parieto-occipital incisure is the depth of the parieto, parieto fissure. And as I'm going to show tomorrow, this parieto-occipital incisure is always, always, always underneath the angle that there is in between the, the, the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture. You have the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture. In the angle in between them, you always have this connection. Broca showed. Very constant relationship. I'm going to be seeing this tomorrow. So, parietoccipital insecure, parietoccipital connection. So, the interparietal sucus here, when it reaches here, change the name. It's interoccipital sucus. Intraparietal, 
intraoccipital. Anatomy, different names. Some people call this superior occipital sulcus. Superior occipital sulcus is the same as intraoccipital sulcus. Now, as I said, you're always going to see a vertical piece of brain here, which is a vertical gyrus that is being called superior occipital gyrus. So I would call this a superior occipital gyrus region. This is very variable in humans. But you always have a vertical piece of brain in here, which is the superior occipital sulcus. Paratoccipital. So what's the name of this piece of brain here? Yes, what's the name? Superior paratolobule. And what's the name of this piece of brain inside here? Exactly, precunius. Well, the parietal, the superior parietal lobule and the precunius is the same piece of brain with two different names. If you see in the convex, you call superior parietal lobule. If you see in the medial surface, you call precunius. You can say the superior parietal lobule is continuous with the precunius also. You can say this, but it's the same piece of brain. The same way. The superior occipital gyrus is continuous with what? What gyrus is this inside here? The cuneus. What gyrus is this down here? Comes from there. Inferior temporal, this is inferior occipital. In this specimen, you have in this side a very well defined middle occipital. This is a very constant, a very good anatomical specimen to take a picture because you have the superior occipital gyrus, you have a middle occipital gyrus, you have inferior occipital gyrus. Superior is always vertical, inferior is always longitudinal here, and middle is variable, but most of the time longitudinal as well. Okay? Now, just as I said, inferior temporal gyrus is continuous with inferior occipital and goes around the corner, is continuous with what gyrus inside here? Lingual. Lingual. So you see, this organization is very easy. So if you have a cavernoma here, what gyrus is this? What sucus is this? So this, what, 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 what piece of brain is this? Inferior parietal lobule. This is supramarginal. And this is the angular. This is superior occipital gyrus region. Medial surface, very constant. You have this very well-defined inner ring, which is the cingulate. Cingulate starts here, all the way here. Then gets narrow. What's the name of this narrow part? Isthmus. And then it's continued with the parahypocampal. Parahypocampal gyrus. What gyrus, what sucus is this again? Calcrine. This is paratoxipto. This is cuneus. Intracuneal suicide, secondary suicide. Intraparietal suicide. They always have this Y shaped. Intraparietal suicide. What gyrus is this? Lingual. You see how it is continuous with the parahypocampal? Just as the, as the isthmus. So this is cuneus, this is precuneus. This is called callosal sucus. Callosal sucus. What sucus is this? Singulate sucus. Always, you remember that I already said, you always have this connection here of the singulate gyrus, the basal, base of the singulate gyrus, with the superior frontal gyrus. This is also superior frontal gyrus. So cingulate sucus starts here because you always have this, 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 this shape here, or so cyanjara here. Cingulate sucus comes here, and then it always, always ends in this ascending terminal branch here, ascending terminal part. And it's very deep, very deep. What is anterior here? Exactly, paracentral lobule. So this is central sucus. You have two, a secondary 
singular terminal part here, but this is the most important. This is the deep one. Now, paracentral lobule is in between the terminal ascending part of the cingulate and another sucus that is very constant, of course, that is called paracentral sucus. Paracentral sucus. So, in between the paracentral sucus and the terminal ascending distal part of the cingulate, this is all paracentral lobule. This is paracentral lobule also. This is the beautiful you, but you have this small piece of brain that belongs in this specimen to the paracentral lobule. Again, this is a region. It's not a very well-defined convolution always. Everything that is anterior to the paracentral sucus is superior frontal gyrus. This is all superior frontal gyrus. Okay? Superior frontal gyrus, just anterior to the paracentral sucus, SMA area here. SMA area, which like the vernic area, is not very well defined. You don't have anatomical boundaries here defined. This is a secondary sucus here. These are secondary sucus. What gyrus is this here? You already told in another specimen. Rectus. The rectus gyrus is delineated superior by the, what's the name of the sucus here? Already said. Superior rostral. And when you end the superior rostral, you always have a connection between the cingulate and the rectus gyrus. What's the name of this beautiful you here? Cingulate pole. Yes, I give. Cingulate pole. Superior rostral gyrus. The inferior rostral gyrus is always <coughs> inside the rectus gyrus. Inside, inside. So this is all rectus gyrus. And rectus gyrus is pretty much continuous with the superior frontal gyrus. Completely continuous. You see the connection that I said you have always here? This Y-shaped gyra here? You see the Y-shaped gyro here? You always have a connection between the cingulate. This is the base of the cingulate with the para, with, with superior frontal. Cingulate pole is here. <coughs> Calcarin, fissure, lingual gyrus. This is cuneus. This is paritoxipto. This is precuneus. Y-shaped secondary subparietal sulci. Subparietal sulci. Subparietal sulci. Y-shaped. You can see them here. And you see how deep this is? So this is cingulate sucus. And when it ascends here, it gets very deep, very deep like here. And so the radiologists see this and said everything that is anterior to this very deep sucus is paracentral lobule. This is paracentral lobule. So this is central sucus, the depth of central sucus. This is paracentral sucus. And this is all superior frontal gyrus. Then it continues with the hostal gyrus, with the, with the rectus gyrus. Let's see better this region we already talked about, superior hostro, cingulate, cingulate pole. Paraterminal gyrus, just anterior to the anterior commissure, then posterior part of factory and anterior part of factory. You have three small gyra here. Septal region is here, particularly inside the paraterminal gyrus. Very small. Septal, septal nuclei are in a very small area, real septum. This is all called para olfactory area of Broca. Lots of names. Septum pellucidum, of course. So this we have anteriorly. Beautiful you. Singulate, singulate pole is another beautiful you. Always anatomically constant. Now, let's see better the parahypocampal gyrus. You see the arrow here? So what gyrus is this? Fusiform. So this is collateral sucus. Para occipto, occipto temporal is lateral to the fusiform. We're going to be seeing better later. What is this? This is the uncus. This is the apex of the uncus. Okay, so the, the head of hippocampus would be here, and the amygdala would be inside here. Inside the apex of the, ins, the, the uncus, <coughs> you have the ambient gyrus, just next to the apex, ambient gyrus. <coughs> 
if we take the parahypocampal gyrus, of course this is the thalamus, you see the fimbria of the fornix, then the gyri, what's the name of this flat surface of the superior, flat surface of the parahypocampal gyrus? Pardon? Subiculum. Okay, you see the antigyra are just medial to the subiculum. The thalamus, the pulvinar is resting over the subiculum. And here you have the unconsucus, unconsucus, unconsucus. But you see that the parahypocampal gyrus is pretty much like a stem of a tree. And the main branches are the lingual, the lingual is continuous with parahypocampal, and the isthmus is continuous here. This is the corpus callosum. You see how the splenium also gets inside this stem, which is the parahypocampal gyrus? You see how deep the calcan fissure is? This is calcan fissure. So PCA can be inside the uncusucus, and then over the subiculum, and then it comes here and can get inside the calcarine. Usually it bifurcates here in calcarine artery and parietoccipital artery. But it can get inside this depth here. So you see, beautiful parahypocampal gyrus. Orbital surface. You always have this H-shaped sulcus, all together called orbital sulcus. Orbital sulcus is always this H shaped. Given this H shaped, you always have this Napoleon head here. Very constant. Posterior orbital gyrus. Posterior orbital gyrus. Anterior orbital gyrus. Medial orbital gyrus and lateral orbital gyrus. Of course, lateral orbital gyrus is continuous with the orbital part of the inferior frontal gyrus. Orbital part, lateral orbital gyrus. It's the same piece of brain. Just like the superior parietal lobule and the precuneus, superior, superior occipital gyrus and the cuneus, orbital part and lateral orbital gyrus, anterior orbital gyrus, posterior orbital gyrus, anterior orbital gyrus, anterior orbital gyrus. Why? Because the most constant is the posterior orbital gyrus. So this is all anterior. Again, I'm not saying that this is a well-defined structure. It's an area that I call anterior orbital gyrus. Medial orbital gyrus pretty much continuous. What gyrus is this here? Rectus, interhemispheric fissure. Rectus gyrus is very narrow here, but it's very tall inside the interhemispheric fissure. And some people say, as I said, I read, more, most constant gyrus of the brain. Might be. I think it's the parsal percularis. But this is very, very constant as well. And here you have the olfactory tract. You have the temporal pole. What is this medial part here? Ancus. What is the name of the sucus that separates the ancus from the rest of the brain, rest of temporal pole? Yes, yeah, somebody in the back. What's the name of the sucus that separates the uncus from the rest of the temporal pole? Rhino sucus. This is paleocortex. This is neocortex. The temporal pole, as I said, is a connection between the superior temporal gyrus and inferior temporal gyrus. The middle is more retracted, shorter. So this is, you see the connection here between the superior temporal and inferior temporal? Just like here. This is neocortical, temporal pole. This is uncus. This is rhinosuchus, rhinosuchus. Anterior perforate substance, anterior limiting, medial olfactory, medial stria, and lateral stria, olfactory stria. Posterior limit, optic tract, medial limit, interhemispheric fissure, lateral limit of anterior perforated substance, the limbing insula you already saw. Everything posterior is a posterior perforated substance. Pituitary stock, mammillary body, third nerves, uncus. Posterior part facing the peduncle, anterior part facing the carotid system. Carotid artery will be here. The bifurcation 
of A1 and M1 is exactly underneath the anterior periphery substance. So when you are opening the fissure, when you see the bifurcation, you do not see the anterior periphery substance. You don't never see because it's posterior. You cannot, you cannot see with the microscope. But you know that just posterior to the bifurcation, you always have all the anterior periphery substance. Okay? Amygdala, head of hippocampus. Parahippocampal gyrus that we already talked about. And this piece of brain here, posterior to the anterior perforate substance and anterior to the anterior commissure, is the ventral, the, 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 the ventral striatum that we, region we talked about that has as its posterior limit the anterior commissure would be in here. The accumbens and everything that we already showed. Okay, and to finish the base, fusiform gyrus. Parahippocampal gy para gyrus. This is rhino. So this is temporal pole here. Fusiform. This is collateral sucus. This is collateral sucus here. And I would say that comes here. I wouldn't say this is uncus. I would say this is all uncus. An ugly uncus that he has here. This is rhino. This is all neocortex, temporal pole. So this is collateral sucus, and this is occipital temporal sucus. Since the fusiform gyrus always have this, this arrow shape, it's because the occipital temporal always meet the collateral and continuous anterior as collateral. This is inferior temporal. Then it's continuous with inferior occipital. That goes around the corner and becomes lingual, which will be continuous with the parahypocampal. So collateral sucus here, posterior, is separating inferior occipital from the lingual, and then separates the fusiform from the parahypocampal. And the occipital temporal separates the fusiform from the inferior temporal and the beginning of the inferior occipital. Anterior half, we will have the inferior horn in here. You see the inferior horn ends at the amygdala that will be inside here, inside here, very distant from the temporal tip. And the posterior half of the fusiform gyrus is the floor of the atrium. The atrium is right here. So interesting to have these relationships in mind. And of course, you recognize all this. Again, this is collateral sulcus. This is occipital temper. This is fusiform. It's the floor of the atrium, as you can see, this morphology here. Okay. I think we'll stop here. We are sort of behind. And uh, that's what the main things about the Sosai and Jairus is this. Let me, let me just tell you something. Uh, as I said, uh, we just uh, had this book published. And I'll leave it here at the table for you to see. Maybe some of you want to uh, acquire this book. And I try to put in this book everything that I'm talking here. Sosai, Jairus, ventricle, deep structures, and uh, the cases I'm going to be showing tomorrow with the cranial cerebral relationships. Okay. Maybe can have lights. Thank you very much.